Think about all the small groups that you're part of. Your family at the dinner table might be a small group. Your friends hanging out on the weekend, that's a small group. Your coworkers at your job, another small group. And then your classmates in a class, another small group. And think about how you navigate successfully between those groups. So maybe with friends, you're kind of free-spirited and crazy, but with your family, you're more reserved and quiet. At work, you just get the job done, but in class, you're outspoken and challenge the professor. So when it comes to groups, size does matter. So we talked about intrapersonal communication. We've talked about interpersonal communication. Now we're moving on to the next level, which is small groups. So most people think of a small group between 3 and 12. Once you start getting above 12 into the teens, groups start to break up into smaller groups. You've probably seen that happen often. So you have 20 or 30 people together, they break into smaller groups just to get things done or just to communicate. So why do we go into groups? Why do we create groups? Well, input from many. Uh, I used to work at a job where my boss said, none of us is as smart as all of us. So you can challenge ideas. Ideas can be evaluated by more than one person before they are accepted. You can increase commitment from others because if you're part of a team and you let people down, there's some peer pressure going on there. And there's also the idea of a risky shift, that groups oftentimes make decisions that are a little more bold and innovative than individuals. As with most advantages, there comes groups of disadvantages. Also, it takes a lot more time. You've been in group projects probably in high school or in other places where, you know, you had a lot of time, you had to do things outside of class. Right? You give up your individuality, so you're going to be part of a team, so you work together. So maybe you're stifling some of your impulses because you have to be good for the team. And then there's a the whole idea of groupthink, where people have sort of reservations about what's going on, but they're afraid to sort of express those reservations. So they don't, and then usually catastrophe or something bad happens. So the shuttle Challenger exploded was a good example of, good example, not the right wording, but an example of groupthink. A lot of the engineers were worried about the shuttle Challenger before it exploded because it was cold that morning and the rings on the rocket engines were sort of contracting. They didn't say anything, though. The shuttle went up and it exploded. So groupthink can be very detrimental to any kind of group process. Groups usually go through development. So we talked in the last lesson about interpersonal communication and sort of relationships. Groups go through sort of similar development. There's a forming stage. You're going to go through these things with your group project for this class. You're probably going to do a little bit of storming, but hopefully it won't be too bad. Then you're going to sort of start feeling comfortable norming. You'll be performing, doing your podcast, and then you'll be adjourning. That's the last one. It doesn't really work as well as all the other INGs, but we've got to do what we can do. So you're part of a work team right now, so you're going to make an implemented decision. So your group decision is to sort of come up with ways to present your topic. There are also study groups. Maybe you've been a part of them where you're working on something for a biology class or a chemistry class or a math class and you're working and learning together. Support groups are another way groups work together, interact and help solve people solve problems. There are committees. You're probably going to put on some kind of committee at some point in your life where you're going to have to study, research, and recommend something to the higher-ups. And there are focus groups. So maybe you've been sort of a part of a focus group, maybe even here on campus about you know campus services and whether we should go no smoking or not. So how do you make decisions in a group? A lot of formal ways of doing it. You've done this your whole life, working in families, deciding where to go on vacation. So maybe it's just parents decide where you want to go. How do your friends decide where you want to go out to eat or what you want to do on that weekend event? Is it a consensus where every member agrees? Is it a simple majority where 51% of the group says yes and the 49% says no? Maybe you have sort of a majority of a smaller majority. So maybe 40% of the group wants to do this, 25 wants to do that, and 35 wants to do that. So the group at 40 wins. Or part of the whole. Maybe you need a super majority to get it. In Congress and sometimes in other legislatures, in order to pass legislation that has financial ramifications, you need a super majority. So maybe 60% of the people have to vote for it. So 41% of the people can sort of prevent something from happening in that case. So how do you solve problems or create ideas or do things? Talk a little about brainstorming where people get together in a small group and just throw ideas out. And remember, at brainstorming, you don't want to throw out any ideas, even if they're ridiculous. So you get all the ideas out there, and then you start going through them and culling them. Right? This builds on sort of the group cohesion, sort of gets things going. So again, don't stifle the discussion at the beginning. Share all the ideas, even the most outlandish ones. You've probably done something like cluster mapping or spider webbing as well. 
So maybe your group gets together and you have a topic and you sort of look at different ways of approaching that topic. You've got to go out and interview a couple of people for your topic, so maybe you want to look at that. What kind of people do you want to interview? Do you want to interview students? Do you want to interview teachers? Do you want to interview older people, younger people? Who do you want to talk to as part of your group project? So maybe you want to do some cluster mapping to figure that out. And how do you solve problems then? So you're going to probably run into some problems in a group. And maybe your problem might be, do you ask the same questions of everybody you're interviewing, or do you ask different questions depending on the person? So a nominal group technique is where everyone works alone in a group to sort of solve a problem. And then each person offers up his or her best idea. And then once the group gets done with that, then you look at the best ideas and sort of decide which ones are even bester, which isn't a word, but that's OK. And then you rank the ideas, and then you sort of critically examine the ideas and then decide which ones you want to implement. So you identify a problem. You've got to present a podcast. Is it a fact, value, or policy? Have you gathered information enough? You've got to go out and interview people. Is your solution workable? So can you create a podcast? Do you have the technology and ability to do this? Can you do it in time? Can you implement this before the deadline? And will it cause harm? Hopefully it won't cause harm. I don't want to hurt my ears listening to your podcast. Solution suggestions. You're going to have to come up with a position on your, on your topic. And then you're going to select something and apply some criteria and consider the risks. And then you're going to implement the solutions. So to throw in some about mediated meetings, teleconferences, video conferences, computer conferences. We've talked a little bit about this in the past, synchronous and asynchronous communication. So right now we're engaged in asynchronous communication. I'm recording this on a Wednesday morning. You may be watching this on a Thursday night or a Saturday afternoon. Um, so it's very asynchronous. When you do your podcast, you're going to submit it to me, and I might listen to it uh, three or four days after you complete it. So again, asynchronous. All right, so a group requires you to be involved. You have to perform different group roles. So it's not just one person is the leader and everyone else is the follower. You may have to be the leader. Maybe the leader gets sick. Maybe the leader is being ineffective. Someone else has to step up. Right? So your goal in a group is to initiate ideas and get things going. Right? So there's a group roles. Leader. So again, it's not a person. You may have different leaders depending on what's going on. There's the lieutenant, which is second in command, usually supports the leader, keeps order, and sometimes becomes the leader when the leader becomes not the leader. Everyone's an information provider. So again, you're going out and interviewing people on your topic, so you're going to bring information to this group, whether you like it or not. The central negative is someone who sort of challenges things. The person who sort of is the devil's advocate questions things. You need someone to do this. You need someone to step back and go, hey, is that the best solution? Should we be doing that? That avoids what we talked about earlier, the group think. Hey, have we considered all the alternatives? Is this the, really the best way to approach this topic? And then you need a tension releaser, because hopefully someone in your group will sort of break the ice and keep things moving smoothly. Maybe when things get a little tense, the tension releaser goes in and you know, cracks a joke or says something funny that gets you back on task. Don't spend all your time being tension releaser, though. That can be very detrimental to a group. How do you deal with difficult people? Lots of ways you can deal with them. Best way is not to placate them. Don't just accept their behavior. Call them out on it. Don't reciprocate. So if they're being nasty, you don't be nasty. Right? Try to convert this person from destructive to constructive behavior. Control directly. Use some leadership skills and control that person. Or if things get too tense, just sort of separate yourself for a while until things calm down. And then maybe go back at it again later on. So we're talking about leadership, are you an authoritarian leader where you dominate things? So oftentimes pe teachers and parents are authoritarian. They direct you because they know better. Are you going to have a democratic group where you vote and sort of everyone has a position and then you can sort of articulate your position? Or are you going to be sort of laissez-faire where you really don't have any kind of structure, you sort of group just does what it does, goes with the flow? Those are all different ways of having a group. So get to work on your group project, create that podcast. And I'll have more information about that in another lesson. Thank you very much.